Hi, um, I wanted to review some of the material from this week in class, um, the 10th and the uh, 12th of uh, September, and then also look ahead to material um, for next week. Um, if you want to skip to the preview of material for next week, then uh, up here I'll put a little time uh, stamp for where in the video you should skip to. Um, so, uh, one of the first things that we talked about um, this week is um, a review of general neurotransmitters and where we are. We've been talking about acetylcholine in the neuromuscular synapse or neuromuscular junction, glutamate as the main brain excitatory neurotransmitter, and GABA as the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Mentioned ATP, but that's not going to come up back really for a little while. And dopamine, we will talk about in some of that uh, upcoming material. There. Um, the uh, glutamate and GABA and acetylcholine at the neuromuscular, and acetylcholine at least at the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine all act as ion channels, so they allow ions to flow through. For glutamate, uh, it's sodium, sodium coming in. For um, acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, it's also sodium coming in. For GABA, it's chloride coming in, so that makes the GABA inhibitory and the other two excitatory. Um, with acetylcholine in particular, acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction needs to be broken down very quickly so that it uh, stops the muscles from contracting after the signal goes away. Um, this, because that is so important at the neuromuscular junction, it, it is actually just something that gets built into every acetylcholine synapse, although it's not clear to me at least that it's necessary at other acetylcholine synapses. Um, so we just talked about how acetylcholine gets broken down to acetate, acetyl and choline, and then those get sucked back into the terminal get put back together into acetylcholine and then put back into a new vesicle. Um, that will come back up when we talk about Alzheimer's disease as well. Um, we then also, we then move on to talk about obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessions and compulsions and the sort of cycle between them and the temporary relief that the compulsions provide. Um, we also discussed how, as with every disease we're going to talk about this semester, OCD comes with a wide range of severities. Um, some of the treatments for OCD involve um, treatments that sort of manage some of the anxiety, which is just a part of the symptoms, including uh, with SSRIs. We'll talk a lot more about SSRIs when we talk about major depressive disorder. Um, these increase the serotonin in the synapse by, by slowing down the removal. Um, and then we also talked in OCD about comorbidities um, and, of OCD. Um, actually, first of all, related diseases, including eating disorder, hoarding disorder, trichotillomania, and so on, um, which is hair pulling, nail picking. Um, comorbid diseases included depression and anxiety. And then there are different reasons why diseases might be comorbid. Um, so one ex possibility is that OCD is stressful. And then this, so once somebody has OCD, that causes stress, and then the stress causes a risk of depression. And that's why we see a higher than expected fraction of people with OCD who also have depression. That is part of the story, but it also turns out that there are other things that could be going on. Um, one is the reverse, um, which is that maybe there are genes that cause risk of depression and that depression, having depression might cause a risk of OCD. There's some evidence, although less, that that might be going on in some people. Um, but another thing that, uh, oops, that's just a repeat of the same slide. Um, another thing that, um, that uh, turns out to, to be going on as well is that there are now known genes that independently increase your risk of OCD or your risk of depression and also known environmental factors which can increase your risk of either disease. Um, and some people might have those genes or those environmental factors and be maybe unlucky enough to develop both diseases that they're at risk for. Um, in terms of how we know that to be the case, um, this is something that we've sort of again talked about is um, if is that um, to figure out that out what we can do is we can have a group of people who have OCD and then we find without depression and then we look at their siblings and what we find is that the siblings have a risk of OCD. That's not a surprise because they have genes in common, and we know that OCD has some genetic risk to it. Um, the siblings have a risk of OCD plus depression. That is consistent with maybe some of their siblings are unlucky and go down both of these paths, or maybe the way the siblings get both is because 
the siblings get OCD, the OCD causes stress, and then they get, and then, and then they, that stress causes them, but maybe not the siblings with just OCD to have a combination. But then this, the sort of surprising and most interesting feature is that um, a higher than expected number of the siblings of people with OCD, but not depression, end up with depression, but not OCD. And that is really only explainable if there are some common genetic risk factors that give rise to a risk of both. And so some siblings go down the path of just OCD, some siblings go down the path of just depression, some siblings go down both paths, maybe some siblings don't develop either. Um, today, we went on to talk about brain changes associated with OCD. Um, but before we went into that, um, we talked about general functions of the different lobes of the cortex. The occipital lobe includes primary visual cortex and is involved in um, visual processing in general. The temporal lobe is involved in hearing and smell and object identification. The parietal lobe has somatosensory cortex, which is involved in touch, and also is, is involved in locating where things are in space and how they're moving. And then the frontal lobe, we're going to talk a lot more about, but it's involved in planning actions, executing actions, and in inhibiting inappropriate actions. Um, in terms of the lobes, um, I neglected to mention on Tuesday, but the parietal, I, the parietal lobe does have this function of um, where things are. Also, because there's always acronyms and there are a lot of acronyms to learn, the primary visual cortex um, has the abbreviation of V1, um, the primary auditory cortex is A1, and the primary somatosensory or touch area is S1, primary motor cortex, which is that area that projects down and can excite and inhibit motor neurons, um, is called M1, primary motor cortex. Um, One other thing that we discussed today, um, which is, is something called epi epigenetics. Now, the sort of like chemistry of what goes on with the genetic material here gets, is way beyond the scope of this course. But it turns out that if you have a healthy mouse healthy female mouse and expose her to a lot of stress, then she starts expressing more cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Um, and this increased cortisol expression is correlated with not mutations, not changes in the DNA code, but rather some extra chemical modifications that change the shape of DNA around the genes that are involved in cortisol production. Um, and that is one reason why stress can, for example, cause just in this female mouse, or male mouse, the same thing would happen, um, but it turns out that, well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but, but it's been, this particular study has involved female mice. Um, so so, um, so this, this, this female mouse expresses cortisol more, and these chemical modifications which change the shape of the, change the sort of physical shape around the DNA that codes for the cortisol genes um, will make it so that those genes are more active and more cortisol gets produced. But not only does that change the cortisol production in her, um, also in her egg cells, those same genes that are involved in cortisol production have these same sort of physical changes to them, structural changes to them, without changing the genetic code, A's, T's, C's, and G's of the genetic code, um, that make it so that those genes have this sort of altered shape. And then if you take that egg, extract it from a female, fertilize it in a test tube, and then implant it into a healthy female who has no stress exposure, no change in cortisol expression, and then let those mice develop and, um, and uh, you know, uh, develop, be born, continue to develop, and then look at them as adults, they will have excess cortisol and they will exhibit increased anxiety behaviors. And so this is, the, the technical term for this is epigenetics. What that literally means is just like on top of genetics. And so what that means is that we didn't change the genetic information, but we changed some of the chemistry surrounding the DNA in a way 
that cause an inheritable change. Um, now these effects are small and doesn't mean that you know anybody who's ever been exposed to stress should never have kids or something like that. Um, but it does, over a large enough number of animals, it is detectable um, and it demonstrates that um, genetic inheritance is complicated um, but that some changes can be passed down through generations. When we talk about ADHD in a couple of weeks after the first exam, we're going to see another example of something like this. Okay. All right. But back to, back to OCD for now. The frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, has two subdivisions. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex along the tops and sides, and the ventral medial along the bottoms and middle, which is also called the orbital medial because it's close to your eyes physically, or just the orbital frontal cortex. Everything has three names. I'm going to call it the orbital frontal cortex. Damage to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex causes loss of motivation, and so the function is to motivate and be involved in planning. Damage to the, doors, to the orbital frontal cortex causes impulsivity and lack of inhibition, so its function is actually a little bit more complicated, um, but partially its function is to inhibit inappropriate behaviors. Another function is to sort of change behaviors when you change situations. So sometimes there was maybe a behavior that wasn't appropriate, and then you get to a new situation, and now it's fine to do that. So, you know, texting in class, not something that is recommended, um, but when you leave class, totally fine to go send your friends text messages. And so, during class, your orbital frontal cortex is suppressing the texting, and then parts of your orbital frontal cortex get activated as you leave class, and you grab your phone and go to text. So, it turns out that at rest, there should be some activity in the orbital frontal cortex sort of suppressing inappropriate behaviors. But one, a number of studies have shown by measuring with functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is an indirect measure of brain activity, people with OCD, their orbital frontal cortexes are more active at rest, which is sort of meaning that they're sort of worried, more worried, sort of these obsessive, it's thought to correlate with obsessive thoughts. And this um, and sort of risk worries, and so um, this is interpreted to be um, an indication that this overactive orbital frontal cortex at rest is part of what's sort of associated with these obsessive thoughts and worries about a lot of things. Now, one question you could ask is, how does this how does this relate to genes and environment? So, one possibility is that. There are some risk factors for OCD, and then those risk factors mean that you have a risk of an overactive OFC, but that some people with that risk never get this overactive OFC, um, and then some people their OFC does go overactive, and then that goes, and then that correlates with OCD. We call that a disease marker because the overactivity correlates with the disease and does not correlate with the risk. Um, so the genetics puts you at risk of overactivity in a disease, but the overactivity only shows up when there's a disease. And so we say that the overactivity marks the disease. It only comes up with the disease. Alternatively, it's possible that the genetic risks or environmental risks or whatever, everybody with those risks gets an overactive orbital frontal cortex. But only some of the people with those risks actually get OCD. And so then we would say that in addition to the genes being a risk factor, overactive orbital frontal cortex, if I see somebody with an overactive orbital frontal cortex, I don't know for sure that they have OCD, but I can say that, that they're at risk of OCD. And then, so that, in other words, the overactivity goes along with the risk, but only some people with the overactivity develop OCD. The way to test that is to have 
do basically the same experiment but include also siblings who don't have OCD along with the patients with OCD, there are siblings who have similar genes but don't have the disease, and then unrelated controls. Again, measuring orbital frontal cortex at rest. And then if orbital, if overactive orbital frontal cortex is a disease marker, then what we're going to expect, expect is that the patients have this overactive OFC, but the siblings who have the genetic risk here don't have an overactive OFC because the overactivity doesn't go along with the risk, it only goes along with the disease. And so then that means that in that something that we're not seeing is that the genes do not change OFC activity, but just give you a risk of overactive OFC. Conversely, if this is a risk factor, if overactive OFC correlates with risk, then that means that the patients plus their siblings should have an overactive OFC, but the controls won't. And then that means that the genes are, again, we can't see the genes causing this, but the genes are causing overactivity. Um, and what we find is that actually it's the latter, that patients plus the siblings have the overactive OFC at rest, more so than controls. And so that tells us that overactivity does not tell you who has OCD, but it just tells you who has a risk of OCD. We also then discussed a very similar study, so looking at now in a different context, not at rest, but when the, remember, the OFC is supposed to turn on when somebody is switching between tasks. And so here, in the Chamberlain study from about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, in a control subject, when somebody switches from a task, from one task to another, the OFC turns on, and that's what it's supposed to do. So the controls have a certain amount of activity. People with OCD, actually, their, their OFC was really overactive when they were hanging out, but then when it's time to switch tasks, their OFC doesn't turn on so much. Um, now that is sort of interpreted to be related to compulsions, where you know there's something you're supposed to be doing, and with a control subject, they do it, and then they don't need to do it anymore. And so their OFC turns on and says, okay, time to switch to something else. But with the OCD patients, their, um, their uh, OFC doesn't turn on and help them switch tasks. Interestingly and kind of surprisingly, healthy siblings also show this underactivity during task switching. This is surprising because the siblings don't have trouble with actually suppressing compulsive behaviors. And so that tells us that, yeah, maybe it's part of this, but this, this underactivity at task switching isn't really a guarantee that you can't avoid the compulsions. It just says that it's harder to avoid the compulsions. It's a risk of being able to avoid the compulsions. And there must be something that's either too small to measure or in some other part of the brain that is different between the relatives and the patients, which does allow these relatives to put aside this compulsive activity, but will not let the patients get away from it. That is something that we don't know what the difference is. Next class period, we are going to talk about um, the basal ganglia and dopamine in general. As I mentioned already in sort of the preview from last week, the basal ganglia is a group of connected inner uh, areas in the brain and collectively, dopamine being released into the basal ganglia causes urges to move. It turns out that the basal ganglia, again, like the orbital frontal cortex, it's very complicated. We're not going to go into the complexity because it's even more complicated than the orbital frontal cortex. But suffice it to say that there are different patterns of activity in the basal ganglia that we observe in people with OCD versus control subjects. Um, 
in addition to the basal ganglia, there are other projections. Um, there are three other projections for um, dopamine in the brain. Um, those three projections are, first, um, an area called the substantia nigra, which is part of the basal ganglia, that sends a projection that releases dopamine into the striatum, which is another part of the basal ganglia. And the function of this is to promote movement. Second, there's an area called the ventral tegmental area. That sends its projections actually in two places. One is to another area called the nucleus accumbens. And the function of that is that dopamine there causes feelings of pleasure. The third brain, the third projection is again from the ventral tegmental area. A different set of axons project up to many areas of the cortex, including the frontal lobes. And the function there for dopamine is in attention. Um, there's other projections as well that we're not going to talk as much about. It's called areas it's called like the insula, which are also involved in feelings of pleasure as well. Um, but um, this VTA to cortex projection is going to come up after the exam when we talk about, um, uh, it's, we're going to talk about a little bit before the exam when we talk about some side effects of medications, um, but then after the exam when we talk about um, uh, when we talk about um, uh, Actually, you know, a lot of this is going to come up after the exam. We talk about Tourette's and ADHD. Um, really, for the for the exam, this is the the main area that we're going to be focusing on. One other thing in terms of preview for stuff that's coming up on Tuesday and that will be on the exam is something called optogenetics. Now, with optogenetics, what this is is it is. Um, there exists in certain algae an ion channel, a sodium permeable ion channel, that gets activated by blue light. And we can take the gene for this sodium channel out of the algae and put it into neurons and then change the neurons in such a way that they become activated by light. Um, and so we can have neurons that have all their same connections, still get all the same input, still fire when they get excited, still get inhibited, still connect out to all the same outputs. But then if we shine a light on those neurons, it happens to be a blue light, but the blue doesn't matter. If we shine a light on those neurons, then what we do is we turn them on. So this is a way to activate specific neurons. We're going to talk about next week on Tuesday, and this is something that will be on the exam on Thursday, some research articles involving changes in activity and OCD-like behaviors in mice. There's going to be a number of research articles that we're going to be talking about related to that on Tuesday. So there's going to be quite a bit of material to sort of um, get into um, with this on Tuesday. Um, so. To give a preview of that, the first study that we're going to look at involves um, a set of mice with no, with, who have a mutation that gives them OCD-like behaviors. One of the things that we observe is that these mice spend a lot more time grooming themselves, so they sort of have compulsive grooming behaviors. And what we find... Um, is that um, in the connections from the cortex, so the, one of the projections into the basal ganglia is from the cortex, and the connections from especially the orbital frontal cortex in the striatum are weaker in these mice. So when we stimulate electrically these, cor these projections, we get a smaller response. A second study did some training behavior where they trained mice 
the same mutant mice to associate a tone, a little beep, with water coming. Um, and then what they did is they kept playing the tone but stopped the water. Um, and what they found is that in these mutant mice with these OCD-like behaviors, they sort of obsessed about the tone and were compelled to keep wiping their heads. So the water shows, the tone beeps, water shows up, they wipe their head. Tone beeps, water shows up, they wipe their head. Tone beeps, water shows up, they wipe their head. Then the tone beeps and the water stops showing up or only shows up 10% of the time. But then these mutant mice keep wiping their head even when the water is not showing up very often when they hear the tone. When the researchers then turned on using this optogenetics, kind of like the electrical stimulation, activated inputs from the orbital frontal cortex into the basal ganglia, what they found is that when these inputs were activated, these mice stopped wiping their head when the tone showed up. So it sort of stopped this OCD-like behavior. The last study that we're going to talk about is a sort of different study where what they did is they took all healthy mice, we'll work through this in class again, but they took all healthy mice and these all healthy mice, they give, they again put this um, uh, channel rhodopsin in so that they could activate these orbital frontal cortex projections into the basal ganglia and in these all healthy mice what they found is that if over a period of many days they kept activating over and over and over and over and over again, kept activating um, the, uh, the orbital frontal cortex projections into the basal ganglia, into the striatum, what they found is that these mice started compulsively grooming and kept grooming over and over again for days and days later. So in healthy mice, so, so, so in, in mutant mice, in the first study, that, are, that have been trained to obsess about this, this tone, when you turn on the orbital frontal cortex connection to the striatum, it stops the obsessive behavior, compulsive behavior. In healthy mice, if you stimulate this connection too much, then it causes them for hours or even days later when the light's off, when you're not stimulating it, they're just constantly grooming. So these are a little bit confusing and kind of controversial and kind of operative, a, a, a kind of um, 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 opposing conclusions. Um, there's actually been a lot of work to try and reconcile these by the different researchers who have done this. And that's some of the things also that we'll talk about on Tuesday. So there's a lot to cover on Tuesday. Um, and some of the homework is going to ask you to sort of start thinking ahead about some of this as well.